Good morning, church family. It's good to see you all, and we're praying for Pastor Luke and the team as they're down in El Salvador and beautiful weather. Brad mentioned two years ago when we were there, I was on the flight that barely made it out. Eric already informed us. Yes, kids. Sorry, I'm telling stories. All right, kids, they're ready. Remember, second through fifth are staying up here. Now back to story time. Okay. They already know what's going on. They don't need me to announce it, do they? So I remember Eric Johnson was with us, and he says, if we get stuck down here, we're starting a caravan. We're, we're driving right back to the United States. It was about a four or five day journey, but we all had to pay him $1,000. So no, <laughs> I'm joking, Eric. So the Bible tells us as Christians that we are to be ready. And you know what you're to be ready for? Yeah, all right, everybody, no, all right. (laughs) You're to be ready to give the hope that you have. Be ready for anybody to say, what hope do you have? What makes you different? You're to be ready to share. The other one, at any moment, any time, a Christian is to be ready to share Jesus Christ for salvation to anyone. The other thing, we are to be ready to be persecuted, We're to be ready for him to come in the air any moment. We're to be ready. So uh, today it was on my heart to just walk us all down the gospel. How do you present it? How do you share it? How do you tell someone how to be saved or to remove the penalty that we're all under from sin? So uh, that's what we're going to go through. In fact, if you have a handout... Some of you got a bulletin. It should look something like this. Raise your hand if you did not get one, and they'll come around and throw them at you. All right, right, here they come. Keep your hand up if you want to participate. And the Pew Bible numbers are on here, so if you don't have a Bible, go ahead and grab one. We're going to walk down this. We're going to look at every scripture. We're even going to read it together. This is all interactive. Can you say yay? That was your moment. All right, every kid in here from second to fifth grade, raise your hand if you don't have one. Okay, keep your hand up because you're going to need it. You're going to want to go through this. Don's coming around. All right, now let's try it again. This is interactive, so everybody say yay. Yay! Yeah, all right, now we're ready. See, I need, we need participation. We got to want to be here. Okay. You know, when I say share the gospel, I'll be the first one to tell you that I was super scared to do it. I thought, Lord, I'm going to mess this up. Don, we got some down in the front when you get it here. They're doing good job, guys. Way to even hold each other's hands up. <laughs> so I was scared to share the gospel. I thought, man, what if I shared I mess it up? What if, what if that person doesn't get saved because of what I say? And there was anxiety, there was fear, there was all this on there. So I know that we could all experience that. I don't know everything that that pastor knows or that person or this or that. How do I share? And here's the thing. You know your story. You know what Jesus did to you. You know the transformation in your life. Can you share that? And then today we're going to walk down an easy, simple way to share Jesus. And here's the cool thing. It's not up to you. You can't save a soul, and neither can I. I cannot forgive sins, and neither can you. Only God can do that. You know what our job is? To be the mouthpiece. That's it. You're just to tell. Now, if we fail to tell, that's the problem. Got me, church? Our job is to be the mouthpiece. We don't save. We don't convert. We don't forgive sins. We just share. And you know what? I have a hard time at that because God's like, that's too much. Shut it down, Seth, right? So our job is very simple. Let's share it. Let's tell about it. So stand with me. Turn to Romans chapter 1. And if you got your, your chair Bible right underneath the rack, We're going to grab it, walk down this together, Romans chapter 1 on page 1116. 
It says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your good news, your gospel message, your wonderful declaration to the whole world that we can be saved. And it's by faith in what you've done and nothing of ourselves. So Lord, help us to understand your good news. Help us to know how to share it. And just thank you, Lord, for making it so simple. And thank you for loving us right where we are. Bless us with our hearing that we may receive your word, that we also may be able to go and to share it out. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So that first scripture, good job, way to go get your Bible. I appreciate it. That first scripture, I'm going to share with you from the Message Bible now, because and I don't always endorse the Message Bible, but I like the way it plain Jane's it for me, uh, and it says it this way. This is Romans 1, 16, 17 again in a different way. It's news I'm most proud of to proclaim, this extraordinary message of God's powerful plan to rescue everyone who trusts him starting with the Jew and then right on to everyone else. God's way of putting people right shows up in acts of faith, confirming what Scripture has said all along, that the just shall live by faith. And then the NLT says it a little bit different. It says, For I am not ashamed of the good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scripture says, it is through faith that the righteous person has life. Here's the good news. Here's the extraordinary news. It's Jesus. It's the gospel. It's the power of God for salvation to every single person and if someone were to walk up to you right now and say, tell me how to be saved, would you be able to? And some of us would say, yes, I'm ready. And some would say, I have no idea. And if you're like me, when I first started, I was totally in fear of it. I really thought I was going to mess it up. And so I had, a, I brought this Bible up here just to show you. I had an older lady at the church. She was 80 years old, and she, I started to serve at this church, and she kept kind of, I would say, nudging me to like, hey, you need to do something. You need to, you need to be a pastor. You need to, hey, hey, and I would say nudge, but it was more like, boom, come on, get with it, right? And she was very graceful about it. Her name was Audrey Gregg, and uh, in 2000. Seven, she gave me this Bible, and she it was all boxed up. It was prettier then, but I've used it. Uh, but she wrote right in the front cover, and she said, this is Audrey Gregg to Seth Bowker, a friend who believes in you as a pastor. And I'm like, Audrey, stop saying that, you know? I Stop it. And here's the thing. She wrote this to me in January or February of 2007. In September, she went to be with the Lord. And you know what? She told her kids and everyone that I was to preach her funeral. <laughs> Audrey, I love you. And I had never done a funeral before, ever. And they're like, they're calling me to do it. I'm like, no. <laughs> this is what Audrey wanted. I know, but no, no. Like, and that was my first funeral. Thank you for the nudge, Audrey. I love you. Uh, now it's precious to me, the push, right? And I can tell you that I 
did the funeral, very nervous, scared. I'm like, I've never done a funeral before. You know, it's okay. They're already dead. I can't mess that up, right? <laughs> Maybe that's too far. Okay. <laughs> All right, I cannot dig a hole up here and lose my job, y'all, okay? I really enjoy Audrey, and I know that this Bible became a source of just pride, love. I still have it, obviously, you can see it. Uh, but it wasn't eight months later, there was me doing a funeral. Eight months later, I get a phone call. His name is Larry, and he's got days to live. And I've never stepped into that situation before in my life. And the family calls me. Hey, Larry wants you to come visit with him. He's met you once when all the power went out and like 20 whatever, and we all gathered together and ate our pancakes and meat. Anyway, it happened. I met him once at everybody's house, and here I am. I'm going to walk into his living room, which... As soon as I walk in the front door, he's 10 feet away on the couch, days to live. And right away, I'm thinking, okay, Lord, I got my Bible. Like, woo, I got my big Bible. I mean, this will hurt somebody when I take it with me. And right away, God put it on my heart. Don't take your Bible. What, what do you mean, Lord? I need to walk through. I mean, when I go down the Romans road, if I turn it around, I can show him all the scriptures and He's like, it's a source of pride for you right now. Don't take it. So I'm like, okay, Lord, I won't take it. But I need something, so I call, if that's the sword of the Lord, I call my little New Testament Psalms my dagger. So I put the dagger in the back pocket, you know, and I'm like, all right, let's go talk to Larry. And I walk in, literally 10 feet away, right in his living room, open the front door. There he is on his couch. He looks over at me, and I said, hi, Larry. I'm here to talk to you about Jesus in the last days of your life. And he looked at me, and he said, all right, I told myself if this guy shows up with the Bible, I'm telling him to turn around and go home. Oh, right away I thought, oh, Lord, thank you for letting me be obedient. But now I can't pull my dagger out. What's the deal? <laughs> like, I was so scared. I got to talk to this man about Jesus Christ, I don't know what to do. And right away, I just start, Lord, help me. I've never been in this situation before. I'm scared. What if I mess this up? These are the last moments of this man's life. I mean, all that's happening. And you know what? God just took over. The scripture that we're about to go down just started to flow out of me. It's not like I'm that smart. You guys know. The Lord can use you to simply be the mouthpiece to anyone, and it changes their life. Are you ready to walk down this and be prepared for that moment? Okay, I got one yes. This is participatory. All right. Oh, you need a handout? No, I'm joking. All right. Let's prepare ourselves to be able to just be the mouthpiece, to share Jesus with anyone in our life. So this comes to the handout. It starts in Romans 3.23. Turn there with me. Romans 3.23. Some have heard it. Some older folks or my age uh, who are still old. <laughs> Romans 3.23 says it this way. Grab the Bible because this you're going to read out loud. Okay, Romans 3.23. For, go ahead and read with me. For... All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So let me ask you this question. How many? Every single one of us. And the sin that is in our life is in every single life. We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So raise your hand if you're in that category. If you've lied, have you ever lied? Raise your hand. And the ones that aren't raising their hand are lying now. <laughs> right? So go ahead and raise your hand twice. 
Here's the thing. God's law, God's perfect law says that just to lie means that we are guilty. He's telling us we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of God's glory. So this little picture right here is you, and it's going to come up on the slide here. This is you standing over here, and this is God on this side, and sin has, is and has separated us from God. Because of sin, we no longer are with God, with fellowship, and it's depicted here. And then we move on to Romans 6.23, and I'm going to have you guys turn there one page over. Read it with me. Romans 6.23. I'll wait till the pages quit turning. All right, Romans 6.23. For the wages of sin. Free gift of God is eternal life, Christ Jesus our Lord. This one verse, one verse, you could share someone, share with someone the gospel, and even just simply draw it out like it's seen here. And if you've met with me for about baptism, I usually do this. But Romans 6.23 on this side, and, and we're going to click one slide forward in case you're a lady, just add two triangles. There you go. See, we got both. All right, moving on. That was fun. Going back. The wages of sin is death. If you, on your side, right underneath you, put sin, and you'll see the slide, Maddie. Go ahead and... Wages, sin, and death. So I'm writing that under me. Now, Romans 3.23 said, how many of us have sinned? Romans 6.23, and I'm doing this with mine, says that the wages, the payment we receive from sin is what? That's God's just, holy decree. Here's the issue. No one can die and make the sin payment and still be alive. There's a, a penalty that you're under. And this brings me to the three things we're going to hit. There, we are under the penalty of sin. There's a power of sin. And there's the presence of sin. If you don't know that you're out from underneath the penalty of sin. You will pay with your life for eternity. That's God's decree. But the coolest part about this is it's not over. God says, yes, the wages of sin is death, and we've all sinned, we've all fallen short. Here's the cool thing. He says, but, and you can write that right in the middle. If you can see mine, I've done it. Right in the middle between you and God, it says, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So on God's side, write free gift, and the screen will show you, free gift of eternal life, in Christ Jesus our Lord. Write that on God's side. Now, I want to share with you that this is something that you could draw on a napkin. In fact, that's where I first learned this. It's called napkin evangelism. You just sit in a restaurant, you're talking to a friend, you want to hear about Jesus? Well, all right. And you just start drawing this out. You can present the whole gospel with Romans 6.23 by saying, you're on this side Here's the penalty we all owe. It's death. Here's God on this side. He has a free gift for you. It's eternal life. And it's only found in Jesus Christ. And so I take and right at the top of my paper, I draw the cross. And you can't quite see it on here. This is the only way we get to cross that gap. And go from where we are to where God is, is because of God and his free gift. And who's it to? All. This is what's so wonderful is God loves us enough right where we are, but loves us enough not to keep us there. He takes 
our wage and our penalty and our payment for sin that we all owe. We all have lied. We all have committed adultery. We've all sinned. We've all fallen short. We've all had idolatry. We've all not kept the Sabbath day holy. Whatever command you want of God, we're all, we broke it. And Jesus takes our penalty of sin and dies for us on the cross and releases us from the penalty of sin. Now, here's the cool thing. He rose again. He's the only one that paid the penalty and came back to life to tell his believers, his followers, those that trust in him, hey, I've put death to death. It's safe to believe in him. He has the power of death. He can change your penalty. Do you know him? Have you ever asked him, Lord, please remove that penalty that I'm under? And you understand the whole world is under that penalty and we're under his wrath of sin that he will pour out and Jesus Christ came to rescue every single person. And it's because of his great love. And so let's move to Romans 5. Go with me to Romans 5. And it, I can tell you this. If you are marking in the Pew Bible, that is A-OK. -okay. In fact, take it with you. Because if you mark this up and you're ready to share it, by all means, take it with you and share it. They'll take that out of my check. Okay. Romans 5, verse 6 through 8, it says, For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. This is Romans 5, verse 6. Now, 7 says, For one will sincerely die, or one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But 8 says this, but God shows his love for us. And while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While I was still on this side, completely under the penalty, under the penalty of death, God loved me enough right where I was to rescue me. He demonstrates his own love. That even while I was weak, while I was without strength, still weak, dead, ungodly sinner on that side, he sent Jesus to die for me and for the whole world. The last part of sharing with someone how to escape the penalty of sin is Romans 10. Look at verse 9 through 13. Circle it, underline it, but be ready to share it. Romans 10, I'm going to start 9 and read to 13. It says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes and is justified. And with the mouth, one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And I would simply say this. Salvation is as close to every person in the sanctuary and in the world. It's as close to them as their own mouth and their own heart. Because when you're hearing, hears that I have to believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, it means that God has paid my penalty and God raised him from the dead and brought him back to life to show me that's paid for on the cross and out of the grave. I believe in my heart, but I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. And when you do that, it says you will be saved. One of my favorite words in there is justified. And I always remember it as just as if I'd never. 
broken God's law. So I'm justified. Before God and His holy law and His perfection, Seth Bowker is going to stand before him and he's going to say, not guilty, you've never sinned. What? Yeah, we know that's woe. That's Jesus only. But without Jesus, I'm still under that penalty. Where if I didn't have Jesus, you know what he'd say? Depart from me. I never knew you. This penalty of sin is for every single person that can be out from under the penalty of sin, rescued by Jesus Christ, saved and set apart as his child, his believer, his church. And if we're there, we can sit back and say, oh, I don't need this. This is just a review. It's true, but are you ready to share it? This is the good news. Here's the other thing we're going to go over. This is the penalty of sin and how to share it. You know what believers live with? Being under the power of sin. Underneath its reign and rule, Christians can fall into a trap and remain under the power of sin and stay in sin and miss the blessings of walking with the Lord and confessing sins. I can tell you, I, I was here. Under the power of sin. And I shared this story at eight. I'll share it here. It was, I was trying to give my life over to Jesus Christ. But I was under addictions of alcohol and drugs and every vile thing that the world had put on me was chaining me up. I was trying to say, Lord, I know you have set me free, but help my body and my thoughts and everything that I am not to run back there to the addictions. Help me to be free. And I was talking to my sweet Aunt Betty. She was about 68. We were at her house, and I was telling her, like, Jesus has changed my life. I mean, my Aunt Betty was going to be a nun. I mean, she was devout, saint, holy. She was, whoa. I didn't think I could ever obtain it, what she was to me. And so I was confessing to her, like, addictions and drugs and alcohol, and like, I want to walk away from that and give God my life and never turn back. I want him to rule and reign. And I'm so drawn to the wrong thing. And she goes, I know exactly what you mean. Like, I, no, Aunt Betty, you've never drank before in your life. I know, you, like, you've never done anything wrong. She's like, I know, but I know what you're saying. I got addictions too. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? And she says, well, when I'm at Walmart, <laughs> those Snickers just want to jump into my cart. And God's telling me, no, your body is a temple and you're to be holy. And those Snickers bars are my battle. And I'm just praying, Lord, don't let me grab them on the shelf. And I'm like, Aunt Betty, you have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> just eat the Snickers. Give me 10. I'll eat them for you. It's fine. I'm like, just go for it. But I realized at that moment no matter what level we are, we got a battle. My sweet Aunt Betty was battling chocolate. I'm trying to walk away from cocaine and alcohol and thinking that there was a difference, but there isn't. It's letting Christ rule and reign in my life and not whatever this world has to offer. And it doesn't matter if it's a Snickers or a substance of any kind, whatever is in this world that wants to rule and reign and live and say, bow to me, I'm your idol, you run away and you say, no, Lord, I want you to rule and reign in my mind, my heart. How about my tongue? My desires. My attitude. Because as soon as I said Walmart, y'all had lost it at Walmart, right? <laughs> That's why we go to Moline now. No. <laughs> Got to have a better witness. <laughs> Are you under the power of sin? Christ can break that. Let's turn to Romans 6. 6 through 14. 
Romans chapter 6, starting in verse 6. It says, We know that our old self was crucified. Do you hear that, believers? Our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. So that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. God's people, if you're enslaved, there's a way out. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as though you have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you're not under the law, but under grace. Hallelujah. We have a key for all Christians to be removed from the slavery of sin, from the body of sin, from the sin that lives in our members and our being and wants to live and reign and rule. And you know how we do it? We present our members to God. Every part. Every part. God's always reminding me of this. He's always saying, Seth, even present your tongue to me that it doesn't bring curses upon those, but it brings grace to the hearers. No gossiping, because that's only running people down. No destructive talk, no slander. Present your tongue to me so you're not harming people, but you're lifting them up, you're building them up. Present your arms to me. What are you going to do for the Lord? What are you going to do? Let Jesus rule every member of your body. This is our call. See, I've heard it said this way. I can picture a Christian being ruled by sin and getting drunk and wasted. But you know what you'll never see at a funeral? The person in the casket getting drunk and wasted. Why? They're dead. Wait, that didn't follow. Christians under the power and rule of sin, have you reckoned yourself dead to the world and alive to Christ? Paul says it this way, Galatians 2.20, that the world has been crucified to me and I have been crucified to the world that I may just know Christ. I don't want anything this world has to offer. It's all rubbish. I just want to know Jesus. I don't want anything in this world to rule and reign. I want Jesus to rule and reign in my heart and life. Are you being brought to slavery? And do you want freedom? I can picture a Christian falling into a lot of sin. But you'll never see a dead guy do that. I can picture a Christian being controlled by substance and gossiping, but I never see a dead guy do that. Are we reckoning ourselves dead to it? Because here's the thing I know. In my heart, there's a resurrection of that old me that is always ready to rule and reign and put me back into slavery. And Jesus says it this way, do not take your freedom and run back to a yoke of slavery when you know He set you free. Run back to Him. He'll do it again. It's humbling to say, hey, I was wrong. I used my tongue wrong. I used my heart wrong. Lord, you know I've totally messed that up. And that was just this morning for breakfast. Help me to be under your rule and reign. There's no other God. 
There's no other way. The power of sin, the penalty of sin, and then what about the presence? Do you know that one day God is going to remove sin altogether? Amen. Sorrow, tears, <laughs> struggle. You know, there's even going to be a word that he redeems. It's called work. No longer will you be under the curse to sweat from your brow for bread, but you'll be in the garden tilling and enjoying it in heaven. There'll be no more weeds. Sweet. I, I mean, you could trip and plant something and you got fruit, you know? Okay. The power of sin, the penalty of sin, the presence of sin in my brain, I think of it backwards. I want to rejoice. Woo! Sin will be gone. Woohoo! And I want to rejoice, but then I realize how selfish I am. That I could say, Lord Jesus, come back now and I'm good. I'm ready. Let's t take me home. I want to till that garden up there. The reality is, I actually hope he doesn't come back for two more hundred years, thousands. There are family that are going to be set outside of his presence because they've never been removed from the penalty of sin. There's still hope. The gospel's still being preached. Jesus is still changing hearts and lives. The presence of sin, when it comes and it's removed, people are going with it. And God didn't design it for people to be punished for sin. He gave us Jesus for the whole world. And he says it's a gift. Tell them the good news. You're no longer able to be punished for it. There's a way out. Are you ready to share it? Go with me to Matthew 25. Page number 988. The presence of sin. And there's going to be a dividing line one day. Matthew 25, verse 34. There's going to be a division line one day where Jesus comes and he divides it up. Matthew 25, verse 34 says, I'll wait for the pages. 25, 34. 25, 34, 34. Soul? Thank you kids for laughing. All right. Verse 34, then the king will say to those on his right hand, come, you who are blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared from the foundation of the world. Do you hear that? Come, you blessed people, people that know Jesus, come on in. The kingdom of heaven prepared for you before the world began. Do you hear that? That's us. Woo, excitement. That's presence of us being served heaven on a platter. Woohoo! Good job, Rachel. Look at verse 41. And then he'll say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. If you don't know that hell was not prepared for people, God does not intend anyone to go. He's removed the penalty through Jesus Christ. Heaven is prepared for people. And he tells us hell is for the devil and his angels, not for any one person. He made a way. And he's saying, who's going to be my mouthpiece? Who's going to go tell them? Who's going to tell them about Jesus? Who's going to say, your penalty is forgiven. You don't have to go. God never prepared it for one person. Why are there people going? We'd say, Lord, send me. Help me to tell them. Help me to be ready to just share. Help me to tell them about Jesus. I've got family that I want to see in heaven. Lord, make it 200 years later so they can all make it. Go to 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. I always say that one backwards. 2 Thessalonians, verse 1, page 1175. 
2 Thessalonians verse 1. I'm going to read 9, but I'm going to start at 7. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. It says, And to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They, verse 9, will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. If you don't know that the penalty has been removed in Christ, there's going to be a day that people are set outside of God's presence. And I don't know if you know this about The fruit of the Spirit that is of God is love, joy, kindness, gentleness, peace. When you're removed from that, that's hell. There's no more love. There's no more joy. There's no more hope. There's no more gospel. There's no more redemption. There's no more salvation. There's people going to be removed from his presence and that forever will be torture. As the band comes, I challenge you, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ to take your penalty, this is the moment. And if you've never accepted Jesus Christ, it's as close to you as your own mouth and your own heart to say, Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner. Save me. Save me from that penalty of death. And then here's the other flip side. If you're a Christian and you're under the power of anything, your mouth, confess. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he was faithful and just to forgive us of all unrighteousness. Confess, Lord, I'm under a yoke of slavery. I don't know how to get out. Will you rule over my life again? And then if there's one person that you know will be set from the presence, lift them up. That's what the altar's for. You want set free from the penalty? I'd love to pray with you right here. You want a recommitment of, Lord, get me out from the yoke of bondage? Love to pray for you. And then you, who's that person that you would like to see in the kingdom? Come and pray for them. Father, we thank you for your truth that you have rescued us, you have saved us. And Lord, we have the good news. We have the greatest news that anyone could ever hear, and that's your saving people because of your great mercy because of your love and not because of anything we've done it's all because of you help us to be your mouthpiece lord to be your church that spreads this gospel throughout this town and county this state this nation lord and around the world where we have people sharing it right now Bless them as they share. And Father, as we go, bless us to share. We're to be your mouthpiece. To spread that good news. And oftentimes it's how we're going to live that speaks louder than our words. It's our character that's Christ in us. Help us, Lord. We need you at every aspect of our life. Thank you for rescuing us. Thank you that we get to praise you for it. And thank you that we get to be in your presence forever because of Christ. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. The altar is open for whatever the Lord's working on you. Let's sing. Let's stand and sing. Come as you are.